Welcome everyone to our autumn series uh, for the Guy Foundation. Uh, it's a very special one for us and we're really looking forward to it. Um, now, uh, I'm Jeffrey Guy uh, and my wife and I were the settlers and founders of the foundation. We have on board uh, today three of our trustees and I'll introduce you to the rest of our team just for the Q&A. Um, but we have uh, our science director, uh, Alistair Nunn with us uh, and Bethany, uh, who looks after our science communications, uh, and Nina, of course, who's in charge of all of us and keeps us all, 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 all in, in tow. Um, we set up the foundation really to facilitate thinking and research uh, into the role of quantum mechanics in living systems and looking forward how this knowledge might be used to advance medicine and therapeutics, uh, both in humans and, and other animals. And over the last few years, we've carried out a number of these symposia, starting with the very fundamental basics of quantum physics, which lost most of us in the biological uh, community. Uh, but we've been working hard over the last five years and run through a number of series. And over the last couple of years, we've been focusing a lot on the physical aspects uh, or the physical environment on Earth, both in terms of gravity, magnetic fields, uh, exposure to photons, inertia, all of these physics issues, and how they may affect uh, uh, molecular activity, mitochondrial function, and then potentially have impacts on the phenotype and, 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 and pathophenotype. And in medicine, and my background is in medicine's research and developed the last um, 35 years, we often look for an accelerated environment in which to study a, a more chronic con con condition. Um, so for diabetes, we looked in the, the Gulf where it was a highly accelerated. And the, these physics, uh, this physical environment uh, for us has been constant throughout uh, human or all, all biological evolution. And we began to think where would we see an alteration to it? And there was some work in the nineties and noughties around increased magnetic fields to do with mobile phones and uh, overhead uh, power cables, but next to nothing in terms of, of uh, areas where the magnetic fields were very low or absent. And this, uh, for this, we turned our attention to space uh, last year or so, and we had a space symposium in February, and we were incredibly surprised about how, in, how many people joined and how interesting the topic became. And that has led to a couple of things from our point of view. We considered some of the quantum aspects of uh, our, that, that may impact uh, um, astronauts in, in, in space. And we decided to do two things. We put a working group together to produce a working document to consider what the issues might be, if there are issues, how they might be mitigated, and what the long, short and long-term consequences might be, both for those that might be traveling beyond low space orbit, but of course the lessons that could be learned in an accelerate, if there's say, for example, an accelerated aging uh, uh, phenotype, the lessons that could be learned uh, in terms of modeling back for human health, health back on, on Earth. The other thing we decided to do was to dedicate this entire uh, 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 autumn symposiums uh, series to uh, to the space program. And so uh, we're going to start with um, a day in the life of an astronaut and the effects on health. And I'll be making the introductions very soon there. Our next session will be looking at mitochondria and space. After that, microgravity and radiation effects. And then we start to get more into the quantum effects of looking at the potential effects of magnetic fields and finishing up with quantum gravity and inertial stresses. Those are the five symposia or colloquia that we'll be holding. And our norm is then to have a sixth series, which is the round table, where we have a quick recap from each of the speakers or a summary from Bethany if the speakers are not able to attend and a round table discussion. And I know that many of you will have been to scientific symposia where round table discussions are very, very dry indeed, but ours are very active. Uh, everybody gets involved and we have actually generated new hypotheses and new research programs from these round tables. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our first speaker today, Dr. Tom Marshburn. And if you forgive me, I'm going to read from his CV, which is very extensive. And uh, But Tom um, holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Davidson College, North Carolina, a Master's in Engineering Physics from the University of Virginia, a Doctorate of Medicine from Wake Forest University and a Master's in Medical Science from the University of Texas Medical Branch. Now, after completing medical school, Tom uh, trained in emergency medicine and practiced for several years 
before joining uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center in November 1994 as a flight surgeon. Uh, he went on to undertake a number of roles, including medical operations lead for the International Space Station. Uh, Tom then undertook astronaut candidate training, which he completed in 2006. Now, uh, Tom is a veteran of three, three space flights. Um, and the third of these space flights, Tom served as a pilot of the SpaceX Crew Dragon Endurance spacecraft as part of the NASA SpaceX Crew 3 mission to the International Space Station, which launched in November 2021. Tom's traveled over 75 million miles. And I think, Tom, I'm correct in saying you've been uh, in space for 337 days. Uh, and have orbited the Earth uh, uh, 2,832 uh, times. you will probably lost count by now, Tom. Uh, so in December 2022, Tom was appointed as Chief Medical Officer for the Human Space Flight Center and Astronaut Training Academy at Sierra Space. Uh, we are delighted, Tom, to welcome you to uh, address our colloquium today, our symposium today. And with that, it's over to you, Tom, if you'd like to share your slides and make your presentation and we will invite questions immediately after your presentation. Tom, over okay. To you. Yeah, y'all can hear me okay? We've got you. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you for the intro. Uh, it's a delight for me to be here to talk to such an August group. I did want to uh, preface um, my my short little uh, presentation here. We'll have Q&A afterwards, but preface that with uh, saying this is this is a very human talk. It's, it's not a, a science presentation. But I was hoping to give uh, present an idea of what it's like to to live and work in space, and that's the purpose of the and and so much information can be given through video. Uh, that's why I've got some video in this as well. So I, I think it's a good idea to reflect on where we are right now. First of all, with the International Space Station, it's sometimes after the end of my last flight, I look back and I went, "Wow, I can't believe that just happened." And, and there we see the International Space Station as it uh, pretty much looks today. It's good to remember that there are adults working in the world and alive in the world that have never known life without a human in space. It's been up there for almost 23 years now. And that space station there that you see is robust. It is alive, working very well. After 23 years, I've been asked, does it look like there is some deterioration going on on board? And, and other than when we do a spacewalk and seeing some discolored areas uh, with some oxidation, uh, no, it, it's got an incredible um, lifespan ahead of it as far as, as far as any of us can tell. Now those solar arrays did degrade a little bit. So uh, there have been a series of spacewalks to put up more solar arrays. Um, on top of those, the technology has improved. And plus there's been just, you know, micrometeoroid hits on the, the solar arrays you see there, the, the big gold uh, panels. The space station is a power station. It's the largest power station ever built in space. That's important because it allows uh, folks to send small payloads up to the space station and just plug it in. So it's a, a vibrant working laboratory. I would say that it is, is just beginning to realize its science potential. So much time was spent just getting that space station built and up there. The thing, questions we're able to ask now are questions that we never even considered would be worthwhile asking when we first started building the space station. And I'm constantly fascinated by what we're finding out, the effects of, of space flight on the individual atom either. You, uh, even you've probably heard of the cold atom <laughs> laboratory. Um, experiment that's going on on, on board there from uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and, and maybe some of you all are involved in that. Uh, but on a cellular level, what happens, it's just, just absolutely astounding. For those who aren't real familiar with this structure, you see that, that horizontal truss, that is not a living area, that's just to support those big solar panels. It's integral to the structure of the power station. But then the, the things that look like uh, cans, that, that's the living structure. It's about the size of a five bedroom house. Uh, I, it's, it's the largest living space ever built um, in orbit. Frank Rubio is up there. He's gonna be coming home fairly soon now, uh, maybe even uh, tomorrow from a year long flight. I think it's remarkable that he's been able to uh, remain so happy and, and uh, 
hardy uh, over an entire year, especially when he didn't even know he was going to be spending a year up there. From in terms of the engineering capability, that's uh, I'm also astounded by it. The uh, things that look like wings that are pointing uh, aft, the, the space station, as you see it right now, is flying towards you in that picture. That's the velocity vector is towards you, as we say. Uh, that's the direction that's it's going in orbit. And the things that are pointing back that look like wings, those are, are heat radiators. They're so efficient that they actually have to point them into the sun so you can uh, keep them from freezing. <laughs> so uh, uh, they work extremely well for temperature control. The environment inside the space station is wonderful, which is, of course, important for habitation. Anybody who flies in space is going to be probably, at least uh, as of today, probably involved in aviation in some aspect. So if you uh, just find out you're going to be flying in space, you might end up in a jet at some point just like this. That's me in the backseat. I was not a uh, military pilot, but I in was inculcated into the, the procedures, the processes, uh, the skills that are required to uh, fly one of these uh, aircraft. The reason for that is because the, the effects on the human, the vibration, the heat, the stress, uh, operating uh, with another person, communicating very effectively, and knowing full well that your actions have ultimate consequences on your life, your safety, or to prevent immense embarrassment if you uh, had to eject for some reason from a mistake you made. All those things are essential in training for space flight. You don't want to put someone in space and for the very first time in their lives, once they're there, actually be in charge of a huge, uh, very expensive uh, vehicle. So this is a wonderful, probably our best training platform to getting into space. And as far as I can tell, it's going to be married uh, to the experience of humans um, flying in space. Now, having said that, probably the... Um, best thing to train people for space is to put them in space and let them work things out. It's so unique. You can't learn everything until you actually go there. That's uh, too expensive. So therefore uh, we have lots of analog training. Anybody flying in space is going to have to get used to this sort of thing. That's me on the, the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Florida in a habitat, which you can see in the kind of in the underwater duskiness there off to the right. Uh, a very small living quarter about the size of a school bus uh, where six of us lived for two weeks. We would do these ocean floor walks, uh, get kind of a mix of technology and a mix of a, a beautiful and wondrous environment. That is inherently dangerous. And that, uh, that's all essential for learning how to, uh, to work and operate in something like a space station. Uh, I have to note, just as a side, uh, it's a, a very human thing that we, uh, we love to talk about as astronauts. All of these aspects of training are, uh, are, are interesting, both from a, a human experience and science standpoint, but sometimes they're just funny. Um, back on the platform back there, there is a small dome that's a tripod. It contains a little bubble of air, and that's where we would go to the bathroom. So we'd come out of our habitat wearing nothing but a bathing suit and a, and a face mask, not all this gear, because you're just going to the bathroom, and swim underwater, and we we're in saturation. So if we were to swim up, it would kill us, no question about it, because we've, we've been living down there for several days, more than 18 hours, and you're, you're a saturated diver. And so we just, uh, you know, just the bathing suit on, swim over to that little tripod, stick your head up in the bubble of air, and do your business. Sometimes, well, I would say all the time, all the wildlife underwater there sees what you're doing and, and comes to you and kind of gets up into that dome with you, including that fish there you see, which is a 200 pound, we estimate, grouper that uh, came to visit me sometimes in the bathroom. Much experiment, experience, much like if you were in a bathroom and a cow walked in to join you, uh, you just have to push it out of the way uh, so you can do what you got to do. And so, um, those are the kind of things that you get used to. Uh, they, they add to life. They're exciting and fun for, for many of us, not all, but uh, the things you get used to just to get ready for something like a space flight. These are the rockets that I've uh, flown on, shuttle on the left. There's the Soyuz being lifted up the day before launch in the middle, uh, the Dragon uh, and SpaceX with, on top of the Falcon 9 on the right. The um, people have asked which was my favorite ride. And I'd say, well, it's like asking which is your favorite child. 
Uh, I'm going to show you a video of a shuttle launch, which is easily the most uh, invigorating or, or violent of the launches with those big white solid rocket uh, boosters that get us off the pad and get us up to about 200 uh, uh, plus thousand feet. The, uh, the, the solid propellant in there, uh, even though it's, it's mixed and it's, uh, they try to get rid of any kind of imperfections and they're still, it's, it's not completely homogeneous like a liquid fuel rocket is. And you can feel all of that, both in all six degrees of freedom. You, you feel that, uh, that motion very much, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So I'm gonna show you a video of my, my first flight, my shuttle launch, I wanna preface it with saying, any space flight experience is probably gonna uh, start something like this. That is, you're going to be uh, in quarantine, isolated, separated from the rest of humanity as much as is possible, still able to say, um, uh, speak to, to family, either they are medically cleared and come in and see you or talk to them, but you're sleep shifting, you're excited, you probably haven't slept well, so you're gonna be very tired when we when you start a space mission that's us walking out on the morning of the launch uh my crew were in our orange uh launch and entry suits in case that's all to keep us alive in case we lose pressure inside the vehicle it's interesting to walk up to the pad and realize except for this closeout crew there is no one else there uh, everybody wants to be far away from this uh, thing that's about to explode and, and go off the pad we do our pressure checks uh in our case uh, we uh, Waited two and a half hours for the launch is our sixth attempt. We didn't think we were gonna go. We all fell asleep. And then nine minutes before launch, uh, launch control woke us up and said, no, you're going today. So what uh, you feel at that moment is that first start is a dull roar, but when those solid rockets hit, it's just a huge kick in the back, a huge acceleration. I'll have to say that anybody leaving the earth going into space is going to experience about four G's th through their back, lying on their back. That's how you get introduced to space. That roll that you just saw is, was particularly delightful in the shuttle because you're off the axis of rotation so we could feel ourselves getting whipped around there. And as I mentioned, the solids are, are quite violent. You're getting uh, knocked around a bit. Uh, you're tightly strapped into your seat. I could read, but I probably couldn't write. Uh, we could communicate through our intercom. And so you hear some shouts of joy uh, as you go up. So here's the solids come off and immediately, much like the Soyuz and the Dragon, it turns into a very smooth flight. You can hear a hum and a vibration that's quite loud and it just this constant smooth pressure of four Gs until this moment, which is main engine cutoff. We release our external tank. And at that moment, you're experiencing weightlessness for the first time. We've uh, we're able to experience a little bit of weightlessness in our parabolic flights, but this is the case where your uh, contents of your abdomen, the uh, blood in your body goes up into your head and it just stays there. And then you know that's the way you're gonna be living for the uh, duration of your mission. The first views of earth uh, for a rookie astronaut or the, what they've been waiting for for 30, 40 years, let's say. And there's the strange aquarium of the inside of the space shuttle, shuttle the mid deck and the flight deck, and the first few seconds after we reach orbit. I wanted to bring that up because the, uh, I'm gonna show you a video here in a moment, but what you feel at that moment, as I mentioned, the fluid getting to your head, the stomach, uh, um, abdominal contents rising up and a complete disorientation. You feel a little bit like, I felt like I'd been uh, laid back into my seat excuse me, laid back into my seat about it with a seven degree head down tilt. Uh, and that's what it feels like with the, the fluid going to the head. I did not get sick. Some people get sick, about two out of five people uh, get pretty ill. Uh, one out of five um, end up vomiting uh, quite a bit. So, but that's just the, the human introduction to uh, being constantly in a weightless state. So here's, uh, fast forward to my last mission. This is about two years ago. Humans in space will enjoy the wonder and the delight of weightlessness. It is very delightful. We do a lot of work, obviously, but we were able to, to just chisel out a few minutes just to do things that humans like to do and uh, just show everyone what it's like to be up there. That's Mark Vandehei, who was the uh, 
the leader of the US segment when we arrived. And humans in space, the things that humans love to do, we love to eat together and it crosses all boundaries. We love to eat together, love to music, uh, listen to music and probably dance as well. I don't have any videos of us dancing, but uh, this is us uh, doing our, our weekly thing where we would get together with our Russian colleagues, everybody on the space station, all hands around the galley table, and uh, we would have dinner together. Tortillas are particularly useful because you can hold your food in your hand. Uh, they have wonderful aerodynamic qualities. You can throw them uh, to each other. But uh, we would uh, share, share food from, from all countries, uh, in our case, Germany, Russia, and, and the US. And uh, everybody uh, had their favorite that would change through, through time. It would switch, switch countries completely. If you ever watch a video of humans on a long duration flight, you're probably gonna see someone in the background exercising. Uh, this is Raja uh, working out on the advanced resistive exercise device, that's Matthias. We have to work out about two and a half hours a day. At least that time needs to be scheduled for us to maintain uh, muscle mass and volume, maintain bone mineral density. Uh, the A-RED is one of the three components. This is Kayla on the treadmill and me. That's what the second of the three components for exercise hardware currently aboard the International Space Station. And then finally, the cycle ergometer, which provides the best cardiovascular workout I've ever had in my life, which is essential to uh, of interest to this group to help prevent the effects of what we call accelerated aging. But after about two weeks, you get to be able to where you can do those things that Matthias was doing. Um, it, takes, it takes about 10 weeks uh, or two weeks to be physiologically adapted and then emotionally, neurovestibularly, uh, mentally adapted probably about a month, one to two months. Well, we do all the normal things you do on earth, uh, just slightly different. Kayla's demonstrating, graciously made this video for everybody wonders how does she wash her hair in space? Uh, she demonstrated that. We don't have any showers up there. It is a bit of a camping trip. So um, we just clean ourselves off with the wet wipes, et cetera. What you're looking at right now is the view out our window at our trip home. It's our escape module, our ambulance, and then our standard trip home at the end of a mission. That's the Dragon spacecraft. I'll talk a little bit more about what it's like to come back uh, from space. But as you know, uh, we fly that capsule. We end up um, breaking, uh, using the rockets to break our orbit, orbital speed so that we start to pick up speed as we fall down into the Earth. And then we let the atmosphere take care of all the other braking that's required uh, to slow us down. And as you know, we go through re-entry. Re We're essentially a meteor. Uh, the outside gets up to about 5,000 degrees. We can feel that heat uh, a little bit coming in. Uh, certainly feel the Gs as they pick up, experience four Gs through the chest again. The wildest part though is after you've come through that entry interface, gotten past all the, the, the heat of re-entry and the high friction, and then we're doing about uh, Mach 2 and the chutes open. That immediate breaking down to uh, a couple hundred miles an hour is, is uh, a huge thump in the chest. Um, and as astronauts say, they, it's the most fun thing uh, about flying in a, in a capsule type of um, vehicle. I, that would put flying in a capsule, in my mind, uh, desirable over a shuttle, which is a smooth re-entry. So, uh, but that's, that's just me. So uh, launch, landing, the two most dangerous parts of spaceflight, and then spacewalks are probably the third most dangerous thing. Uh, what's on an astronaut's mind when they're in space? If they have a spacewalk uh, scheduled, then before they get that done every day, that spacewalk is on their mind. It's, uh, as Dave Wolf, uh, one of my colleagues would say, my life's path, path is a why. The uh, why starts with a spacewalk. And one of two paths will go after that. And that is I mess something up and broke something and not, my life will never be the same. Or the other path when everything went smoothly and, uh, and I go on that path. We all want to be on that path. So we can't get a uh, spacewalk out of our mind besides the fact that it is dangerous. The suit, um, that's me um, on uh, my second station flight. The suit is at a 4.2 PSI pressure. It's hundred percent oxygen. Uh, that oxygen, uh, level is required because of the low pressure and the low pressure is required so we can move inside the suit. Otherwise, if we were at atmospheric pressure, we would be unable to, we'd be like inflated 
uh, on the inside of a uh, football is you know, that kind of tension and we wouldn't be able to move our arms. So <clears throat> we go through a decompression uh, protocol so we don't get the bends, go out and do our spacewalk. We call it a walk, but you're actually moving around with your hands. I'll have a, another slide here in a minute. And, uh, and then focus on the task. The training is, is really wonderful. Uh, it's eight hours, typically six to eight hours of work straight with 32 ounces of water, but no nutrition otherwise. Um, you come back uh, exhausted, uh, dehydrated, and thrilled with the experience, um, typically, if, if all goes well. On my last flight, so I did this about uh, coming up on two years ago. Uh, you can see the robotic arm coming over. I came out uh, from the space stations, got situated with my feet inside that foot restraint, just sort of locked my feet in. It's a bit of a tenuous attachment, but locked my feet in. And I'm coming in. Um, my crewmates are driving this robotic arm, driving me in, as we say, to that uh, cone-shaped object in the base that it's on. That's a big antenna. It weighs about 250 pounds. Kayla uh, was out on her first spacewalk. She was my spacewalk partner. She's at the base there. You can't see her right now, but she's at the base getting ready to unbolt it so I can pick it up. And I'm going to transfer it over to another part of the station and bring it back, bring back a new one. The, uh, the transfer uh, was wonderful. That robotic arm, which is about 30 feet in total length, and then with my stand here, about 35 feet, um, that's how long it is. And it's sort of like a windshield wiper on a car. It's picking me up. And I was going over the top of the station and then putting it down uh, in its stowage area. And while I couldn't get this view, I was able to get my fisheye lens of my camera and sort of reach out and take this picture of the space station and the earth below it. You can see my toes, I think, at the very top. That's my toes in the, in the foot restraint. Um, I like to mention this about at this time that one of my feet slipped out uh, and my only attachment left was my other foot. Um, you, you certainly don't want to be in a position where you're floating, come off and floating away for many reasons, uh, especially in this, uh, this far away from the space station, but you also don't want the ground to see it. So I kind of had my uh, helmet cameras kind of pointed away, like got my, got my foot back in there and, and got situated. So every moment of a spacewalk is, uh, is tense. There are microseconds of sheer terror but there are uh, when your heart rate goes up, but otherwise you're just uh, intensely focused on your work. So that's that's a kind of a summary of life in space. Now, uh, Dr. Smith will recognize this is an old chart. There's some updates that need to be made to it, um, but it still speaks to the uh, it's it's nice, I think, to just look at the overall picture of the physiologic changes. And Dr. Smith knows this much better than I and will we'll speak to a lot of this. Um, but I, just as an overview very quickly, you see that horizontal line, the clinical horizon, that's when uh, the human being absolutely knows, uh, can feel. Um, and, a, and a physician that uh, was evaluating them could see uh, the effects of weightlessness on the human body. So as soon as you get into space, the neurovestibular system, uh, as I mentioned, people get sick. Certainly your ability to orient yourself is affected and it's very hard to get useful work done. You're solving about 10,000 problems every day, trying to figure out uh, where do I put my feet? Where do I put my workstation? How do I get anything useful done? And so uh, that's, uh, you, you figure that out in a few days. And then, in a, as I mentioned, about a month, you feel like you're, you're master of your world. Uh, fluids and electrolytes, you feel the, the edema uh, essentially in your, in your head. You can see it in people. You can see what looks like jugular venous distension. Um, there are eye effects. This is an old chart. It doesn't have the SANS issues uh, that we have. We think it's the fluid shifts that can cause some of the eyesight changes uh, and changes in intraocular pressure. Uh, cardiovascular system, certainly uh, we are, the cardiovascular system would atrophy if we didn't exercise it uh, very much. And so we spend a lot of time in that to the point to where now when we do our in-flight echoes, it's almost indiscernible, um, the, the human's heart in weightlessness if they've been undergoing this exercise regimen as compared to uh, human heart uh, pre and post-flight. Uh, the one thing that's definitely out of date here, the bone and calcium metabolism, that's a straight line shown here. It does look like that starts to uh, plateau off four to six months. Um, but uh, regardless, bone mineral density loss in space, um, the, uh, the whole cycle of bone breakdown and rebuilding in space is accelerated. And what we rebuild, our, what our body rebuilds our uh, bones with 
is a different architecture than what it does in 1G. So I carry within my bones the effects of space flight and it will for the rest of my life. Whether it affects me uh, in my life, have more fractures, that's still to be determined, but it doesn't appear to be a problem. <clears throat> now, one thing that um, uh, will always be a, an, an issue, something to consider is the radiation effects. We are radiation workers. Um, and then uh, finally, and Dr. Smith, uh, a, a point of data that's very important for his work and for all of us really is, is uh, lean body mass. Um, kind of as an intro to his talk, I will say for the human that lives in space, an appreciation for not just the nutrition, what we put into our bodies, but the, uh, and what he works on the entire milieu, that is the exercise to use that energy and to use that protein, the rest to allow your body to recover. Uh, so that involves the, the workload. All of those aspects are, are essential to human, not, not just uh, efficiency, but to survival. Um, cause it even affects your, your, um, psychological state, uh, vastly as you can imagine in space. So with that, uh, kind of semi-scientific ending, uh, to the presentation, I'm going to release my screen. And, uh, if y'all have any questions, please, please ask. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely fascinating. It's very kind of you to give that presentation. So that, uh, brings me on to our, our next speaker who is Dr. Scott Smith. Now, uh, Scott holds a, a bachelor's degree in biology and a PhD in nutrition, uh, both from Pennsylvania State University and leads the Nutritional Biochemistry Laboratory in the Human Health and Performance Directorate at NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center. Uh, the group is charged with keeping crews healthy with respect to nutrition, including using nutrition to optimize astronauts' health and safety. Now, this work includes both ground-based and spaceflight research to understand how nutrition can uh, mitigate the risks of spaceflight. Uh, Scott has ongoing research projects on the International Space Station. His past projects have been flown on the space, uh, on not only the space station, but the Space Shuttle and uh, uh, Russian space station Mir. He's also had several ground-based, rather fascinating ground-based research projects to better understand astronaut health in space. And these include vitamin D studies in Antarctica, studies of crews living on the bottom of the ocean, and studies to test subjects spending weeks to months in bed. Sounds like students to me. Um, so with that, with that, I'd say that Scott is also a member of the American Society of Nutrition, the American uh, Physiological Society, and the International Academy of astronautics. Uh, Scott, if I may invite you to present your talk to, to the group, uh, the uh, lectures over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the very kind introduction and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Um, it's an honor to be here and, uh, and it's a bigger honor to get to follow uh, my old friend, Tom Marshburn. I would like to start with something uh, perhaps a little bit abstract, but to give you a different perspective, this is uh, London at night, seen from the space station, um, which seemed a little bit fitting here today. Um, I am here representing my colleague, Dr. Sarah Zwart, and the two of us lead what we call the Nutritional Biochemistry Lab. Um, everything at NASA has to have a logo, and uh, this is ours. Um, NASA logos are overwrought with detail, and ours is no exception, but highlighting the, the space station there, um, along with our efforts to get to the moon and off to Mars, um, looking at the interaction of the human with food um, and, uh, and some of the other complexities in there, all the way down to the black dot that you might be able to see over there that I will talk about um, as I go through this. One of the things I'd like to point out is that um, we are the Nutritional Biochemistry Lab. We are not the food lab. So there's a different group of food scientists at the Johnson Space Center in Houston that are responsible for developing the food system and flying the food system. And while we interact with them quite a bit, um, that is not what we do. In a nutshell, our job is to understand and try to define the nutritional requirements for astronauts on, on space missions and try to understand how the body changes um, and in many ways, how we can use nutrition as a way to mitigate uh, some of the negative effects of spaceflight on the human body. And again, what I hope to do here uh, briefly today is to give you a bit of a an overview of some of the things we've done, some, some touch points, um, and then drill into some of the more recent work um, that is ongoing. 
So we've been working on the space station, as Tom talked about, for, for quite some time now. And, and our lab in general does two types of work. We do what we call operational work and we do research. From an operational perspective, uh, I like to think of that as take care of each astronaut one at a time. And we do a complete nutritional assessment workup on the astronauts uh, that go to space station. Before and after flight, we collect blood and we collect urine and look at a whole host of biochemistry to make sure that when we send them up there, we send them up as healthy as can be. And then we look at them again when they get back um, to evaluate if there are any decrements uh, or anything that needs attention from a nutrition point of view that we can work with the rehabilitation team to get them back to full health as quickly as possible. During flight, there's two things we track. One is body mass. And the picture in the middle there is Karen Nyberg on what we call the SLAM-D. Everything in NASA also has to have an acronym. The SLAM-D is the Space Linear Acceleration Mass Measuring Device. And the way it works is she is locked into position there on that device. It, it's locked in about a foot away from the wall. You push a button, it pulls you towards the wall with a known force. It measures your acceleration. And using the physics of force equals mass times acceleration, we can calculate body mass. That is a, a, a bit of a, a glimpse into how some of the more basic elements of, uh, of, of medicine, if you will, uh, become extremely challenging during flight. But when you think about it, every time somebody goes to the doctor's office, the first thing they do is get your weight. Because changes in weight over time are a very good general indicator of your overall health. And the idea of sending people away in a strange environment for six months at a time, a year at a time, um, and not being able to track body mass um, would be a significant limitation. The other thing we do from a nutrition point of view is we track dietary intake. We developed an iPad app that you can see there uh, floating in the cupola on the left and in Peggy Whitson's hand on the right. And this was a, an iPad app that we again developed that we essentially asked the crew to record everything that they eat. And uh, the crews really liked the app. The, the, their response to it was phenomenal and, uh, and gave us some really, really good um, detailed data that we're, we're still working on a lot of the nuances to. But I think part of the reason the crew liked it was because it was autonomous so that they literally could see at lunch um, if they where they are in terms of calories for the day and what they needed to eat at dinner or how much they needed to drink to meet their requirements. Um, and I think the idea that, that they could do that on their own without somebody telling them that they needed to, uh, to eat more broccoli um, was really valuable for them. While they could see the data real time, we would get the data down once a week. We would generate a report for the flight surgeons, highlighting key nutrients, um, and then work with the surgeons to help um, maintain the crew's uh, dietary intake over the course of the flight. In terms of where we are right now, again, Tom mentioned that Frank Rubio uh, is on station. Last week, he set the record for, for the duration, for continuous duration off the planet for an American. The Russians still hold that record uh, in general, but uh, Frank set the record uh, for an American astronaut last week. Um, and he will come home. He'll land in Kazakhstan next Wednesday. He'll get back to Houston next Thursday. And uh, our team will be there with needles and bottles for him to start collecting blood and urine samples uh, to do that assessment work when he gets back. So that's the operational work that we do. On the other side of the coin, we do research. In many ways, we are a soft money research lab, meaning we scratch and claw for funding like every research lab on the planet. Um, and we tend to spend most of, most of my time, at least, trying to find people to give us money um, and then convincing them that, that we did a good job with it. We do two types of research. Again, Tom touched on some of this, but we do ground-based research and we do space flight research. On the ground, we tend to do what we call analog work. And what we try to do is simulate different elements of space flight to be able to study it on Earth. And there's no perfect analog besides actual space flight. But again, depending on what you're looking at, there's different ways you can do different things. So bed rest studies are one, again, you heard mentioned, we will put people into bed for weeks to months on end and can look at things like muscle loss and bone loss and ocular changes. And those, those work very well for those, uh, for those phenomenon. We tend to do six degree head down tilt bed rest um, 
where uh, you're tilted in such a position that you get some of the fluid shifts that Tom talked about. We've piggybacked onto some of the, the underwater missions that Tom mentioned. And what we've done there from our knot hole is studying things like oxidative stress and uh, vitamin changes, vitamin metabolism, iron metabolism, red blood cell metabolism um, in a hyperbaric uh, environment that essentially induces oxidative damage in the astronauts that are down there for a week or two. We've done some work in Antarctica because we wanted to look at vitamin D supplementation and we wanted to find how much vitamin D we needed to supplement people with when they didn't see the sun for six months, which is, is the way space station is. And that led us to go to, the, to Antarctica where we did a couple of studies. We didn't study the penguins, but they're cuter than the people that we did study. And we did two studies down there. One looked at different doses of vitamin D to look at the responsiveness. And the second was one that we collaborated with our colleagues in the immune lab. And we looked at the interrelationship of not only vitamin D status and vitamin D supplementation, but also the interaction with stress and immune system function and viral reactivation. And we used that data, which we published back in 2011 in a paper that we wrote after the, the COVID pandemic started, positing that the relationships that we saw in Antarctica where individuals with lower vitamin D status and higher levels of stress tended to reactivate viruses more. And we posited that that might help explain why some individuals have a much harder course of COVID infection than do others. And looking back now with a lot more data that people have collected, um, it's clear that vitamin D indeed is one of the nutritional factors that um, is very important with immune system function. Um, and again, gives you um, one example of how some of the work that we do for the few people that are off the planet has significant potential for our understanding of health and medicine uh, for the rest of us here on Earth. We also do chamber studies. Um, the, the picture on the bottom right there is a, is a habitat where we've had crews of four people live for up to 45 days. These um, habitat studies tend to be looking for things like stress, interpersonal reactions, um, and, and different mission stress, uh, sleep deprivation kind of thing. Um, and when you have people in a confined environment and you can control what they're eating, we can do nutritional studies. And one of the studies that we did was looking at the very basic, I just think it's kind of a stupid question of, if we feed people better food, will that show up in the physiology? And we recently published a paper showing that indeed that is the case. Um, so as you can see, we do some, some interesting and exciting ground research, but nothing beats flight research. Um, we've had some tremendous opportunities over the years to do research. Um, nutrition research in space tends to look like where we collect dietary intake data and we collect blood samples. And you can see the picture on the top left of a crew member drawing a blood sample. Um, the centrifuge in the second picture, um, typically you don't find your centrifuge in the wall, but it works. Um, we collect urine samples. There's a urine collection device um, there in the, that third picture. And then the samples are frozen down at, at minus 96 degrees Celsius um, until they return to Earth for us to analyze them. As I said, we've had a tremendous number of opportunities to collect data and samples uh, from astronauts. Um, we've, we've done what I think is reasonably well with that. And at this point, we've published over 35 different papers of our work from space station. Everything from looking at vitamins to minerals to the relationship of exercise and bone health. We've looked at hormones uh, and, and a number of other factors. And, and again, I'll drill into some of those um, in the rest of the talk. To show you some of the data, this is uh, on the left is a dietary intake graph. So the blue symbols there, each blue symbol is an astronaut. Each red symbol is a female astronaut and the dot represents their average intake of servings per day of fruits and vegetables. The white dot represents that we looked at the set of foods that are available to the astronauts and we made what is what we consider to be the best menu that we could. 
And to pause there for a second, we fly a set of foods for the crew that repeat about every eight days. There's a small amount of food that they get to augment that with that they can select things that they want. Um, but 80% of the food is very repetitive and it, it's fixed. So what you can see with that white dot is that the best we could come up with from the food system we're flying is about three and a half servings of fruits and vegetables per day. So I can criticize the astronauts that they're only getting two and a half servings per day. But the reality is we'd like them to be getting six servings of fruits and vegetables per day, which is where that dotted line is at the top. And I use this to make the point that the food system that we're flying is the one that we have. It's not necessarily the one that we want. And we continue to work with our colleagues in the food lab to try to improve upon this. Why does this matter? If you look at the graph on the right, those data show you that. And this is, again, each dot represents an astronaut. We're now looking at fruit and vegetable intake on the, on the x-axis compared to anti total antioxidant capacity on the y-axis. And what you can see is that there's a significant relationship that is crews that ate more fruits and vegetables had better antioxidant protection at landing than did crews that did not. And as I always like to say, this is the biochemical evidence that your mother was right and you really need to do eat your fruits and vegetables. And again, this is biochemical evidence of why we need to feed our astronauts better. Bone loss is obviously a significant concern and we've, there's been a lot of study of bone loss during spaceflight. And from a nutrition perspective, some of the things that we found uh, relate to the fact that, that our diet affects our bone health on here on earth as well as in space. Uh, we published a paper a few years back that showed that crew members that ate more fish and we tied that to omega-3 fatty acid intake lost less bone. We've similarly shown crews that eat better with more fruits and vegetables have better bone health and lose less bone. And on the other side, diets that are high in sodium, crew members that have higher iron stores, those two factors are detrimental to bone. Our colleague Martina here over in Germany um, has done an exquisite series of studies looking at the implications of high sodium intakes on bone health. Um, and again, as we look to fly a better food system, it would look like this. It would have more omega-3 fatty acids, it would have more fruits and vegetables, it would have less sodium, and it would have less iron. And that was the premise of a study that um, we did in collaboration with our, our colleagues over in the food lab. Grace Douglas is the principal investigator for that work. Um, we published the chamber study that I mentioned um, about six months ago. And uh, the flight study called the food physiology study is ongoing right now on space station. The picture there in the top right is Victor Glover, who was one of the early crew members. Uh, Tom Marshburn was also one of the crew members participating in that study. And uh, to answer the question that he threw to me, um, one of the outcomes that we're looking at in that study is effects on the microbiome. So um, Tom and Frank were, were early, or excuse me, Tom and, and Victor were early subjects in that study. Frank Rubio on Space Station right now um, is the last participant in that study. So once he comes home and once the rest of the samples come home, um, we will start to analyze those and we're very excited uh, to get those results to see if we can replicate what happened uh, in the ground-based study. So I mentioned with the food system that, that the, the food system is fixed and the crews get to pick about 20% of the food items that are foods that they want. And we call those, they get separate containers, they're called crew-specific menu containers. And those are very important because the standard food system is, was built for diversity. That is, it was designed to have as many different food items as possible because the crews told us that variety was one of the biggest issues for them in terms of menu boredom. So an example I always give is, you know, again, over a period of about eight days, they get a, a set of containers of food. And in those containers, there might be say three servings of oatmeal. If a crew member likes oatmeal, there's three servings for eight days. If the crew member hates oatmeal, there's three servings for eight days. 
if a crew member likes oatmeal and their other crewmates like oatmeal, they need to make sure they get there first. And if somebody wants to have oatmeal every day, for one example, then they need to pack their crew specific menu containers to account for that. Otherwise, they're not going to get to eat what they want. Okay. The other thing that's very unique about Space Station is that every time a vehicle goes up, they put fresh fruits and vegetables in there. It might be oranges, it might be apples, tomatoes, the Russians will fly onions. Um, there's not much. Uh, they usually only last a couple of days. But from a psychological point of view, and probably to a small degree from a nutritional point of view, those are extremely important for the crew. So several years ago, five, six, seven years ago, the space station program came to the scientific community and said, we want to use space station as a way to simulate a Mars mission. How can you do that? And our colleagues in the food lab went to the space station program and said, okay, on a Mars mission, we are not going to have the ability to fly crew specific foods. We are not going to have the ability to fly fresh fruits and vegetables. So stop doing those two things and we will study those crews and see how well they eat, how well they perform, how well their bodies adapt. And the space station program looked at that and said, yeah, we're not going to do that. And I think in part that tells you just how important those two elements are for the crew. So from that, again, my colleague Grace Douglas in the food lab went off on a, on a journey, if you will, to create an environment that would allow us to do an analog study on Earth that would simulate a Mars mission. That analog is what we call CHIPIA. It is the Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog. It's a 378-day mission that we started back in June. Today is day 87. We have a crew of four living in a habitat on the Johnson Space Center. The habitat was 3D printed out of cement. The cement was red tinged to give it a Mars feel. You can see some of the, the areas on the left, the top left there is the living area. Uh, the kitchen is off to the right, it's kind of hard to see, but then there's uh, a sort of a work area where they can meet and, and view things on screen. And then on the farther, uh, there's a set of lounge chairs uh, with a TV where they can watch movies and play video games. And then beyond that door is, is some of the work area. The picture on the bottom left shows you the way the, the bedroom looks. And the picture is kind of deceiving, but that little wall in the middle there is the wall. So you're seeing the entire bedroom for that one crew member. It's a 1,700 square foot habitat. And then attached to it through an airlock is a 1,200 square foot red sand box that crews will do spacewalks. Um, they will have activities they need to do. There are rocks and samples buried in the sand that they'll need to find. There are structures they'll need to put together. You can't see it in this picture, but there's a treadmill um, around the side that they will use to create um, traversing from the habitat distances to allow them to, to simulate the workload that we would expect on a real Martian mission. As I said, the crew will be in there a total of 378 days. From the time at which the door closed behind them, they were, they were under a 22-minute communications gap, as a crew on Mars would be. So if they send an email to Mission Control, 22 minutes later, Mission Control gets that email. And if the answer is quick and Mission Control writes the answer down and sends it immediately, 22 minutes after that, the crew will get that, that information. So there's a 45 minute lag between asking your question and getting the answer, um, which gives you a, a, an entirely different way to look at, uh, at this type of mission. And as Tom talked about, um, crew selection for these types of things, um, keeping the crew busy with, with functional work um, and, and evaluating the impact of the food system on that, um, seeing how well they can deal with the logistics of these types of missions. They are under water restrictions. The food system is limited, so they need to be careful not to overuse either of those things. They need to take care of the habitat. Elements in the habitat will break either by plan or by reality. Um, and they will need to figure out how to deal with that um, in near real time. And this, to me, is an incredible effort. This has been about five or six years in the making. Um, and the fact that I'm talking to you 
um, about this today is really one of the most incredible steps forward to us really being able to try to put people onto a real Martian mission. And again, just from our knot hole, today is not only day 87, today is our third in mission blood and urine collection. Um, so monthly we're collecting blood, urine, saliva, and fecal samples where we're essentially doing a, a matched set of analyses to what we're doing in that other study. So we are doing um, microbiome evaluations in that study as well. I'll mention this as well, but one of the one of the more significant issues that came up in the last 15 years is that some astronauts come back with changes in their eyes. And they've dubbed the SANS, which is Spaceflight Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. It's not my favorite acronym, but they didn't ask me. And in short, this relates to the fact that there are changes in some astronauts' eyes. There's some nuance to it. There's a number of factors to it, but um, a few of the hallmarks are, are optic disc edema, that is swelling of the optic disc or the point where the optic nerve enters the eye, um, choroidal folds, um, cotton wool spots, some other, some other ocular pathologies um, that affect some astronauts. And when I talk about SANS, I always like to make two points that you, you always need to remember. One is that as of right now, we do not know what causes this. There's a lot of people out there with theories. There's a lot of people maintaining that this is all related to fluid shifts, that you go into space flight, your weight list, the fluid pr brushes into your head, the pressure in your head goes up, and it pushes on, on your optic nerve, it pushes on your eye, and causes this problem. The second reality of this is that not everybody gets it. And there's some debate over the incidence rate, but in reality, there's, there's only about 20% of crews that develop clinically significant changes in their eyes. So if this was as simple as fluid shift pushing on your eye, everybody would get it. If it was related to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the air has a higher CO2 levels than we experience here on Earth, then again, they're all breathing the same air, and you would expect everybody to develop this problem, and they don't. When this came up, again, 13, 14 years ago, we, as I said, were doing experiments where we were collecting blood and urine samples, and we were measuring a whole host of biochemistry. One of the things we were looking at is a biochemical pathway that is known as one-carbon metabolism. This is a, a critical biochemical pathway that occurs in every cell in the body. It's called one carbon metabolism because this is how you move single carbon units around. This is how you convert amino acids and interconvert amino acids. This is how you methylate DNA. It's a very nutrition rich pathway. So vitamin B6, vitamin B12, riboflavin, biotin, all B vitamins that are all related um, in the function of this pathway. One of the chemicals in the middle of the pathway shown here is HCY is homocysteine. And this is a, an, an amino acid metabolite that is also known as a cardiovascular risk factor. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we started to look at this when we, when we began our experiments, because we were interested in folate status and folate metabolism and wanted to see if there might be interrelationships between changes in folate that we'd observed and changes in some of the cardiovascular system function that had been noted by um, other scientists. When SANS came about, we started to look at our data. And one of the first things we realized is that there were differences in one carbon metabolism. Specifically, when we looked at the blood concentrations of homocysteine, astronauts had developed eye issues had significantly higher concentrations of homocysteine in their blood, shown here in the yellow line, than did astronauts that did not develop eye issues, shown here in the white line. And more importantly, those that developed vision issues had higher concentrations of homocysteine before flight. And we ruled out a number of factors that we thought might be affecting homocysteine. The fact that we're seeing homocysteine differences before flight 
led us to hypothesize that this may be related to genetic differences, because we know there are a number of, of genetic differences that can affect homocysteine and can affect one carbon metabolism. We initiated a study where we looked at a handful of, of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, and I show you two here. Each of these are data from astronauts. Each symbol is an astronaut. And if we look at the graph on the left, the SNP there is the MTRR A66G. And everybody with the minor form of that SNP, that is the GG form of that SNP, everybody that had the, that form of genetics developed eye issues. Now, this isn't a smoking gun, and we never thought it would be because there are a lot of people that developed eye issues that did not have that SNP. But the fact that this cell here was empty when we first brought these data out it was when some of the people that couldn't believe that your genetics and or vitamin status might affect your eyes started to think there might be something here. One of the other SNPs we looked at was serine hydroxymethyltransferase. And again, everybody with a major form of that SNP all but one case developed optic discodema. Now, again, there are a lot of people with that form of the genetics that did not develop optic discodema, but this was pretty good information that there was something going on here. What we maintain is that genetics and B vitamin status predispose some individuals to develop this problem. Again, data from analog studies, we, we worked with our colleagues over in Germany who designed a bed rest study. This was a 30-day study where they were going to alter the atmosphere so that the subjects in the study would be exposed to higher CO2 levels. Again, the atmosphere in board, on board space station has higher CO2 levels, about 10 times higher than here on Earth. And there were a lot of people that felt that that might be one of the causing causative factors in SANS development. The graph here is showing you the change in total retinal thickness, which is a measure of optic disc edema. And the way we broke these data out is individuals with three or four of the risk alleles in those two SNPs that I talked about are shown in the yellow line. And what you can see is that they had significantly greater changes in retinal thickness than did individuals that did not have those genetics. This was not a balanced study in that all the subjects were exposed to carbon dioxide. We then had to wait for a second study to be done where we didn't expose subjects to CO2. And those data are shown here. And what you can see is in principle, we saw the same thing. That is individuals with the forms of genetics I've talked about had significantly greater retinal thickening than did individuals that did not have those genetics. But that the response between the two studies was significantly blunted. And we maintain that this reflects the fact that CO2 is likely still a player in this, in this equation. But as with everything at NASA, there's some debate between us and our colleagues in terms of whether or not, um, whether or not they, they agree with that. And we'll, We'll wait and see how those data play out. I won't belabor this, but one of the questions we've often gotten is, well, how can your genetics and vitamin status affect your eyes? And we built, in essence, two hypotheses for how that could happen. And that is characterized here. We published this. Again, I won't belabor this um, for time, among other things. But what we maintain is that this is a multi-hit phenomenon, that your genetics are affecting your B vitamin status. Your B vitamin status affects blood vessel and endothelial function in particular. It affects nitric oxide synthesis and affects the ability of blood vessels to, to constrict. And it, it causes endothelial dysfunction or stiffening of the vessels. And that in light of other factors that occur during space flight, things like fluid shifts, insulin resistance, um, radiation, carbon dioxide, or other factors that we don't know of, put those things together and that that can lead to changes in either drainage of CSF out of the head, which could increase pressure and, and pressure on the optic nerve and on the eye, or 
hypothetically could affect the elasticity of the sclera, which is the back of the eye shown there in, in light blue, that could make it susceptible to fluid shifts uh, during spaceflight, making it more, um, more prone to uh, choroidal folds and some of these other changes that we're seeing. This is a hypothesis, which means we don't know this is true, um, but there is scientific evidence for each of the arrows on that image. We just don't have enough information to know if end to end this is what happens. But based on our data, um, we maintain these are the best hypotheses out there. This doesn't mean the fluid shift hypothesis is wrong or that it's not related to carbon dioxide. But what we maintain is that there's something about the individuals that are developing the problem that respond differently to those phenomenon. And you need both of these things together to actually understand what the cause of this is. The big question, the real question anybody cares about is whether or not we can use B vitamin supplements to override the effect of the genetics to mitigate or, SANS, or, or prevent SANS development in individuals who are at risk. Two and a half years ago, we were asked to go develop a flight study to test that. And last month, our first participating crew member launched a space station on board the SpaceX Crew-7 vehicle. Um, they started taking the supplements about six months before flight. They will take them every day during flight. Um, our first uh, OCT imaging in the back of their eye is scheduled for early October. And we hope to test 16 subjects by the time we're done. I will tell you, we, we do not have the ability to select astronauts based on their genetics to participate in the study, because if we did that, then by nature, the fact that somebody was in our study would give away their genetics. And we always need to be very careful of, uh, of respecting the privacy of the individuals, um, especially given some of the implications of, of some of these phenomena. So with that, I come to an image. This is uh, back from the early 1990s. This is when we were celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus's trip. And those are replicas of his ships in the front with the space shuttle Endeavour in the back. And I often talk about nutrition and exploration in light of the age of sail. And we know that scurvy, everybody always has sort of a vague idea that scurvy was a big deal. Realize that scurvy caused, scurvy killed more sailors than all other causes of death combined. And through the 400 years of the age of sail, more than 2 million sailors died of scurvy. And when it was finally realized that lemons and limes could cure that, um, realized that lemons and limes don't cure scurvy through magic. They cure scurvy through nutritional biochemistry. And it's important as we try to understand physiology and the pathophysiology of what happens to astronauts, that we need to study the underlying biochemistry because that is what causes the physiology to do what it does. And that therein lies the understanding of how these things happen and how we can help to correct them. That, I, again, thank you for the opportunity to present here today.